All right. Good morning, everybody. Wow. Thank you, Pastor Scott. Good morning, everybody. (laughs) Good morning. Uh, Once again, that's one of my favorite sounds is to hear people connecting and uh, just loving on each other. This morning, we as an entire church, our kids included, so if you have kids in family ministry, they are learning the same thing this morning. We are in a sermon series called Faithful where we are diving in to God's faithfulness found in scripture while also being reminded of his faithfulness in our own lives. Pastor Scott, as always, did an incredible job last week pointing us to the faithfulness found in the life of Noah. And if you missed it or you want a refresher, I could not encourage you more to go back and to listen to that. And it's a powerful reminder of what God calls us to. This morning, as always, I am so grateful that together as a church, we get to share life together. This includes opening up God's word together. Sharing life means having the opportunity to fall more and more in love with Jesus together. (laughs) Sharing life means pointing each other to the Lord in every season together. (laughs) It means that we're on this journey together. And for that, I'm really, really grateful. And so together... Let's start out in prayer. God, we thank you for this gift. We thank you that you are the same God today as you've always been. God, we thank you for giving us your word so that we can better know your ways and your heart. Holy Spirit, help us to understand what we read today. Change us from the inside out. Father, we pray that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to understand the truth of your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen. This morning, I want to start out with a couple things that I know about us, okay? And this is very much myself included. The first thing that I know about us is that we as humans love a good plan. Do we have any planners in the room? Anybody that loves a good plan? Okay. Personally, I plan out just about anything, anything and everything. I think we have a picture I've been planning things since 93, y'all. Been planning since 93. I plan out goals. I plan out schedules. Maybe you plan out projects. I plan out my day. I plan out my vacations. I plan out my naps. Anybody? I plan out naps. I plan the plans that I will plan next. You give this girl some cardstock, a Sharpie, a highlighter, and something to plan, and I am on it. And before you go with the flow, people find me boring. Don't worry. I plan when I want to be spontaneous and fun, (laughs) which is not today because I have a nap planned from 2 to 5 today. So today is not the plan for spontaneous and fun. But it's safe to say that I'm not alone, both in planning maybe a nap for today, but also in the desire to have some kind of a grasp on what is coming. I would venture to say that even if you did not raise your hand saying that you are a planner, even if you are the go with the flow person, that you could care less about calendars or organizing your day, you still seek some sort of sense of direction and plan in life. A plan provides all of us with a sense of purpose. It provides us with action. It provides a sense of control and it provides a sense of direction that humanly we desire to have. We want to have a plan. As kids, we're encouraged to plan out what we want to be when we grow up, to plan out our classes in high school. As adults, we plan the lives we want to live, where we hope to work, the house, the community we want to live in, the cars we drive. We plan everything from financial goals to meals to the values that we will live our life with. Humanly, we have a desire to have a sense of direction and a plan. I know that about us. The second thing that I know about us, once again, myself included, we don't love to wait. Waiting is not our thing. How do I know? Well, let me give you some personal examples. At one point, I literally paid extra money to have the book Addicted to Hurry shipped faster to my house. (laughs) How do I know? Because more than once, I have gone out in public with slightly damp clothes because I didn't want to wait for them to dry in the dryer. How do I know? Because I cannot help but compare every fast food drive through to the glorious and beautiful efficiency that is Chick-fil-A, everybody. How do I know that I don't like waiting? Because I have to physically take a deep breath when I see a YouTube video buffering. How do I know I don't like waiting? 
because I have more than once burnt the roof of my mouth not wanting to wait for the food to cool, specifically pizza rolls. Those things will get you. We don't hope for the longest checkout line. We don't pick the longest route when driving somewhere. We don't hope for the stoplight to turn red. Like we don't go to people and say, "Hey, I'm gonna go to uh, I'm gonna go as slowly as possible to the grocery store. I really hope it takes forever, and I'll see you hopefully a long time from now." No, literally last night I said, "I'll be as quick as I can, Micah. I'm coming." We don't say that. And even if we're not considered impatient people, and I wouldn't necessarily consider myself impatient. I don't like to wait. I don't choose to wait. We are conditioned in society to not want to wait. Our world is obsessed with efficiency in hopes of reducing wait time and ramping up productivity from apps to medicines to softwares to life hacks to digital programming, shortened video snippets, systems all made, all made aimed to satisfy faster. Humanly, we have some kind of a desire for less waiting. And so here we are. We want less waiting, more answers, higher efficiency, productive days, all in hopes that it goes according to plan. And before I go on, you need to hear me really loud and clear. Having answers is great. Efficiency is not bad. Faster is not wrong. Productivity is wonderful. Plans are necessary, but there's a tension there. And the tension comes when the timing of the things that you hold dear are not what you had planned. Like it's one thing to wait for clothes to dry, it's a whole other thing to wait on an answer of a prayer. It's one thing to wait on pizza rolls to cool, but it's a whole other thing to wait for your loved one to find Jesus. It's one thing to wait for a video to load. It's a whole other thing to wait for the unplanned mountain that's staring you in the face. It's one thing to wait on a traffic light. It's a whole other thing to wait for healing. It's one thing to plan to take the shortest route. It's a whole other thing when you feel like your life has been flipped upside down with unplanned detours. This morning, I want to talk about the really hard seasons of waiting. Seasons where maybe you feel like God has gone silent or you keep getting the answer, not yet. Seasons where your timing and God's timing don't seem to be on the same page. This morning, I want to talk about the mountains you didn't plan to climb. When you look at scripture, you'll see example after example after example of imperfect people who love God, who also find themselves in seasons of waiting, life not going according to their personal plan. Scripture is full of them. The particular example we're going to look at today, and I would encourage you to look at the screen or if you have your Bible with you, is in the book of Genesis. It's the first book in the Bible right at the very front, and it was written with the purpose of recording the story of God's beautiful creation and his desire to have people worship him. We see this when in the very beginning, God created Adam and Eve, and they were in his presence, but through their act of sin and rebellion, relationship with God was broken. But God, being a faithful God who keeps his promises, had a plan to give all humanity the opportunity to restore the relationship that had been broken and to once again personally experience him and the blessings that come with it. God had a plan. And the plan came through a covenant, which is the big word for the unbreakable promise that God gave to a man named Abraham. And God promised that he was going to restore and rescue and bless the world through Abraham's family. Now, Abraham was married to a woman named Sarah, and a few things you need to know about him, or maybe it's a refresher, they loved the Lord, but with their love for the Lord, also, they were still very human and far from perfect. They didn't always get it right. Deception and control, conflict and doubt would be a part of their story, along with twists and turns and waiting in the unplanned. We see their story in Genesis chapter 12, when God challenges Abraham to move to a new land. And within that plan and that challenge, there was a promise. 
With this, with this call came the promise that God would make Abraham's family into a great nation. So if you would read with me in Genesis chapter 12. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. We see within the chapters of their story that as time passes and as they wait, Abraham and Sarah both faced unexpected obstacles, some at their own bringing. And while we don't know exactly how much time passed, we know three chapters down, Abraham asks a very real and a very human question. And we can see that there was waiting It says, sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, don't be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you and your reward will be great. But Abram replied, oh, sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? In verse five, it says, then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. An important part of their story, an important part to note in this is that Abraham and Sarah had had the dream of having children of their own, but at this point had not yet conceived. And it was a grief that they carried. Waiting was something they knew of well. And it puts more weight into the question when he asks God, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? They knew what it meant to wait. My guess is that Abraham, like us, may have had a different timeline and a different plan in, plan in mind at times. Moving to a new land may not have been in the plan. Waiting for a son as long as they did may not have been in his original timeline. And while they didn't always get it right in their imperfections, the next verse would impact generations to come. Upon God reminding Abraham of the promise he had given to him, we find that Abraham took the opportunity. He took the opportunity to choose to trust God. Verse 6 says, And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Abraham chose to trust God in the waiting and in the change of plans. And the story doesn't end there. God did, in fact, keep his promise with Abram at 100 years old and Sarah at 90. They would find to have the son that they were promised, a son named Isaac. With the birth of Isaac came more opportunities for Abraham to choose to trust God's plan and timing. The life of Isaac would have more waiting and other change of plans. But he chose to trust God's plan when faced with the possibility of losing Isaac in order to display love and obedience to God. Abraham would choose to trust God's timing when he obeyed God in finding the, white, the right wife for Isaac, a wife named Rebecca, whom together Isaac together would grow the family that God had promised. Abraham did just that. Despite his own humanity, mistakes, despite what seemed at times humanly impossible, despite the natural desire for his own plan and his own timing, he chose to trust God because he knew that God is a faithful God who keeps his promises. Isaac and Rebekah would have a son named Jacob whom God blessed and called Israel. Israel would become the name of God's family, a great nation of people, and Jesus the Messiah and Savior was born from that very nation, just as God had promised. All in God's plan and timing through the life of an imperfect man who in the waiting chose to trust God. In May of 2011, I was a senior in high school 
and I was finishing up my senior year in Anderson, Indiana, and was ready for the fall to go to Indiana Wesleyan University. And when I say ready, y'all, I had it planned. Everything from my roommate to my room decor was planned. I'll never forget my dad asking me to pray about the next season that I was getting ready to go into. And one day, as I was driving to one of my final days of high school, I was praying about what I should do in the fall and if that was the right plan. And I remember as clear as day in that car that God asked me to wait. And that is not what I thought he was going to (laughs) do. But he asked me to wait, and he asked me to not go, and he asked me to trust him. When I tell you this was so contrary to what I thought was going to happen, but like, and like Abraham, I sure had not always gotten it right. (laughs) But I took the opportunity to trust God and found myself also in a season of waiting. As we sit here today, also examples of imperfect people, (laughs) loving God while also finding ourselves in seasons of waiting, Seasons where life's not going according to what we had planned and timing feels anything but on time. Careers and jobs, diagnosis, relationships, financial burdens, worry for your kids, watching the ones you love hurt. We find ourselves in seasons of waiting, waiting for answers, waiting for restoration. And in this season of waiting, I have really good news for each of us. The same God who could be trusted then is the same God who could be trusted now. The same God who had the whole world in his hands then has the whole world in his hands now. The same God who took the impossible then and made it possible is the same God who makes it possible today. The same God who kept his promise then is the same God who keeps his promise now. Now hear me out. I got to tell you, I got to tell you what God didn't promise He didn't promise easy. He didn't promise to always say yes. God never promised personal success or a life that was absent of pain. He didn't promise a life of perfection or to give us exactly what we think is best. But he does promise presence. (laughs) He promises purpose. He promises peace providing love and strength. He promises wisdom, promises transformation. He promises forgiveness. He promises the hope of eternity. And today you don't have to take my word for it. You can take his. We see his presence promised in Matthew. He says, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We see his purpose promised in Philippians. I am certain that God who began a good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. We see his peace promised in Philippians, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for what he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. We see his providing promised also in Philippians, and the same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. We see his love promised in 1 John. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. We see his 
We see a strength promised in Isaiah. But those who trust in the Lord will find a new strength. They will soar high on the wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. We see wisdom promised in James. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. We see transformation promised in 2 Corinthians. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and the new life has begun. We see forgiveness promised in 1 John. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and will cleanse us from all wickedness. For it is his hope of eternity that we are promised in John 3, 16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God keeps his promises. I talk about that season of waiting in college and it wasn't easy, but in my steps of trust, I experienced his promises fulfilled. I experienced his presence, his purpose, an unexplainable peace that everything for the next year had just changed. I experienced his providing and his love, his strength, I experienced his wisdom and transformation and hope of eternity, and not because of anything about me other than choosing to trust the Lord. In that season of waiting, not according to my plan or time, I would find myself on a blind date at Panera Bread with a guy named Micah Walls. And on display in his life then and now, would be a love for Jesus that propels me to seek Jesus. In that season of waiting, I would find myself doing two things that I had previously said in life I would never do. (laughs) Work at a church and do anything that had to do with public speaking. (laughs) Literally vowed I would never do that. In the season of waiting, Micah and I would begin a journey of ministry together as we served as local youth pastors in our home church. Spending precious years with the honor of sharing life in Jesus with an incredible group of teenagers who took a family photo with us at our wedding. Now hear me out. Choosing to trust God did not mean that life became perfect for me. Far from perfect. But it does mean that God was faithful to his promises. That season of waiting would not be the last one. And as I look back, it also wasn't the hardest. There have been harder. But it would be a personal testimony to myself of God's faithfulness for his glory, not mine. This morning, for you who are in a hard season of waiting, maybe feeling like God has gone silent, for you who feel as though not yet keeps being the answer, or to feel like your timing and God's timing could not be any different. For you who have obstacles staring you in the face, the ones that you did not plan for, when the timing seems off, when the waiting seems way too long, when the plan seems all but efficient, may you be confidently reminded that God has not left. He has not left you. He hasn't stopped loving you. He hasn't stopped pursuing you. You and I, like Abraham, can make a choice to trust in the faithful God who keeps his promises. You know, some of God's greatest gifts come when you choose to climb the mountain with him. This morning, I believe that God is calling each of us to take a step of trust. And it looks like saying, Lord, in this season of waiting, help me to worship while I wait. It looks like saying this unanswered prayer, Lord, have your will, not mine. God, this plan of mine that I formulated, it's yours. God, this desire of my heart, I wanna desire yours 
what's your desire? Father, this life that I have planned out, you can have it all, every piece of it. I choose to trust you to do what's best in your time. I'm yours, my plan is yours, my life is yours. This season of waiting is yours. May I know you more and more and more and more in the waiting. As I was driving in the car this week, uh, the song that we're getting ready to sing came on and my three-year-old Malachi was in the back seat belting out the words, great is your faithfulness to me. And as a mom, I looked in the rear view mirror and when I hear him singing those words, I want nothing more. I want nothing more than when he's three and 30 and 90 to declare that because he knows and trusts in the God who loves him and has not left him. Not now, not later. I want nothing more than for him to worship in the seasons of waiting that will come for him, in the life of imperfection that will come for him. I want him to know and trust and stand in a posture of surrender that says, Lord, me, Malachi, I'm yours. Have your way. Help me to do what you want me to do. It's your plan and your time. And I thought, as much as my heart ached as I watched him in the rearview mirror singing those words, as much as my heart ached, ached that he would believe that and grow to know and fall in love with the Lord. How much more does our heavenly father want that for him and for me and for you and for your children and your children's children? A posture of surrender that says, Lord, your will be done. I choose to trust you. Take this season of waiting and may I glorify you in every single piece of it. How much more does God want that for us? He's inviting us today to say, give me your timeline, give me your plan, give me your heart because I can be trusted. So this morning I'm gonna pray and I would invite you that as we sing that you would stand in a personal response to your willingness to say, God, whatever this is, have your way to a faithful God who keeps his promises. Would you pray with me? Father, as we sing, hear our hearts and desire to trust you more. Help us to trust your timing, to trust your plan, to trust your word. Help us to worship in the waiting, including now we declare you faithful. And as we sing and declare, God, would we stand in a posture of surrender to want more of you. God, lead and guide in Jesus' name.